This is the Speak for Yourself podcast featuring the best of Colin Cowherd and Jason Whitlock. I'm your host, Jason McIntyre. It's Friday, Easter weekend. Colin Cowherd missing again. But we've got the NBA playoffs. Right off the top, Whitlock argues resting NBA players will be the nail in the coffin for LeBron in comparison to Michael Jordan. Chris Boussard breaks down why my Golden State Warriors are the clear favorite and takes you through their route to the NBA Finals. Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker Ryan Shazier joins the show to talk about Ben Roethlisberger and if he's seriously considered retirement. Plus, we got to talk about Eli Manning getting his hand caught in the cookie jar in this pathetic memorabilia scandal. And finally, we discuss the dysfunctional New York Knicks. Notice they're no longer my New York Knicks. I have to abandon them for sticking with this clown, Phil Jackson. Ready for Speak for Yourself? Take it away, Whitlock. Hello and welcome. Cowherd is out today. So his co-host, Christine Leahy, is here subbing for Cowherd. We're also joined by Fox NBA analyst Chris Broussard and Jim Jackson. Let's start where we always like to start, LeBron James. <laughs> Who will begin his quest for a fourth title and a seventh straight finals appearance tomorrow against my Indiana Pacers? According to FoxSports.com, LeBron's chance to surpass Michael Jordan is on the line in these playoffs. If he doesn't win a title this year, the conversation, according to FoxSports.com, is over for good. I actually think, and, and I hadn't been there before the season, I think the conversation's over. I, I think there's LeBron, uh, by taking some risks this year and being more outspoken on a variety of issues, but particularly on this resting players issue, I think this is going to be checkmate for him in the Jordan discussion. Jordan always tried to play 82. I think he played 82 games eight times in his career, played more than 80, I think 10 or 11 times in his career. Jordan thought it was his responsibility to put on the show every night. I, I, I think adding that to the discussion, it doesn't matter if LeBron gets a fourth title. He's got finals losses. I think it's over even before these playoffs begin. I agree, and I don't even like this discussion for two reasons. LeBron, he has to get seven championships in order to pass Michael Jordan. That's to not be even better a, than Jordan. That's not even a discussion point. Is he better than Kobe? Is LeBron better than yeah. Kobe? Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would say so. Think, but he doesn't have. But Michael you know, Jordan six and zero in the finals. LeBron three and four in the finals. So that you can't even compare. And also, why do we have to have this idea of? One is better than the other. Can't they just be two separate players we, we, we in, must two different, in two we different must, eras? Well, why we got to compare, Chris? Exactly. <laughs> what, what, why we need it? a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a discussion we got to have. And I've said at the very least, LeBron's got to win this year and next year. That would give That's him a three-peat. Right. You could argue he's beat better teams. I mean, this Golden State team, I think, is better than any team Jordan ever beat in the finals. Uh, they're stacked. You know, I mean, they won 73, then they added the second best player in the mm -hmm. world. So I think that would be the argument for LeBron. And even then, I don't know that he'd win it. The thing that hurts LeBron is that Dallas loss when he yeah, was in Miami yeah. and mm -hmm. you saw him just not, he didn't bring it. Fold. However you, you want to say, folded, whatever you want to call it. Well, it, not in yeah, the finals. It, yeah, the once in the finals. S San Antonio at the back end of it, one game. When they, his last year yeah, in Miami? Yeah. He played well. You talking about the cramps? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jordan hey. never had those moments. You guys can't talk about cramps. <laughs> Here, here's my thing, though. But have we seen a player? It's when I saw LeBron practice and play in high school. When I saw him, he was totally different than what I've seen before. So we're trying to compare a player that's a hybrid of Michael Magic and a combination of the size of Carl Malone to Michael Jordan which is not fair because they're, they're totally different in how they play, how they approach the game. But, of course, you go comparing to the GOAT. With LeBron, too, he would have to win seven championships, two or three more MVPs, to even be in discussion because of what Michael was able to do. Now, from a talent perspective, you talked about the Bulls. To me, the Bulls teams weren't the most talented every time. I thought the Portland team in 92 was more talented, 1 through 12. The Seattle team was more talented. But the core group was there. They were built together with Scotty. Then Rodman came in, and Phil was the, the linchpin there. 
LeBron is being unju unfairly judged. No one in the history has come out of high school with those kind of expectations, and he's exceeded them, but yet and I still... Can one so guy. you're giving I him credit give him one for guy that has exceeded it? A hundred percent. Who? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He didn't Lou go out, straight out of high school. He, he, he didn't he, go... He, he, that's what I'm saying, but came straight out of high school. Well, that's a limited group of people. Right. Very limited, but when you talk about... Someone prodigy. coming out of New yeah, York, no, yeah, that's, yeah, a prodigy, yeah, right. seven foot, goes to college, dominates, they have to change, change the, the rules, rules, comes to the NBA. And again, that's why I say the, the, the Jordan conversation is off the table. And I think we're almost being offensive to Kareem. And not even I, mention him. Yes, yes. Because again, they, you can put together an argument. Kareem mm -hmm. is the greatest yeah, player, no, the greatest closer. Again, we just because we don't like the sky hook and it doesn't make great film. The sky hook was unstoppable, I, I, and then the guy shot seventy five percent. Yeah, from the line. I, I, is, it because, he, is it because he's a center? Yeah, and it's not a sexy still, position. Yeah, but he closed out more teams and more games than yes. anybody. I do think LeBron's on Mount Rushmore. Yeah, the top yeah, four. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I definitely I believe think that. He's on Mount I, I don't know who we, you with would, Kareem. Oh, I would say Kareem, uh, Michael, Magic. LeBron, and Magic. Where would you put Wilt? I mean, I can only go for Bill Russell. <laughs> Bill, Russell. Bill, Russell. Bill Russell. Bill Russell. Larry Bird. I mean, there's a lot of other guys. Yeah. But, but see, he's such, he's such a different animal. We haven't seen, as much as we pound on him and we get on LeBron about being soft or this, we haven't seen a player at 6'8", 6'9", 250, do the things that he's able to do. No both question. bad and good. Well, both bad and good. But the further we get away from it, when this time is done, oh, yeah. we're going to be comparing players to him. Of course. The generation course. underneath that is going to be who's the next LeBron. As you know, as we get further away from it. But I, like I, I agree with you in the conversation. Please. To LeBron's biggest competition for the title, the Golden State Warriors. Vegas has Golden State as an overwhelming favorite to win the title this year, despite Kevin Durant coming back from a serious knee injury and a much tougher road to the finals than the Cavaliers. Having said that, I agree. I think Golden State is the overwhelming favorite here. Uh, they have played very well down the stretch. Uh, Steph Curry has found himself again. Steve Kerr has legalized Steph Curry to continue <laughs> playing that way on into the playoffs. I, they're an overwhelming for, favorite. I, I think when they, I think they'll beat Cleveland if, if it's Cleveland in six, maybe even five games in the final. Wow. As long as Draymond keeps his feet to himself <laughs> and doesn't tackle anyone, I, they have to be better, right? They were up 3-1 to one against the Cavs last year, and now they added Kevin Durant. Steph Curry, like you said, playing better. So I think everyone's just going to elevate together. Plus, the Cavs worry me right now. They really do. I think we could see a meltdown at any minute. Yeah, I don't think Golden State goes seven in any series. Um, I think they go mm. five with Portland, four or five with the Clippers. Uh-huh. Five or six with the Spurs and six with the Cavs. Um, and the Cavs, to your point, the only reason, let's face it, the only reason we think they're going to not, if you give them a chance to challenge Golden State, but even get to the finals is because in LeBron we trust. We haven't seen anything over the past, like, three months to make us think they can even win the East. Their record since the All-Star game was the ninth worst, ninth best in the East. So if the All-Star game was like the beginning of the season, they wouldn't have even made the playoffs. So we're just all saying, look, LeBron's so great, he's going to be able to win the East and get them to the finals. But we really haven't seen evidence of that. So I think, yeah, Golden State should be favored heavily. And how much everybody. the Cavs have to do with that? Again, their play, think about it, at the beginning of the season, it was, well, can Golden State, you know, blend the talents of Kevin Durant and get back? Cleveland has already said it's a no-brainer. Then that narrative shifted on the second half of the season because of Cleveland. And I think you made a point, great point yesterday in regards to Cleveland now being the villain a little bit right. in regards to sitting out players and all of this. So you have that to deal with mm -hmm. from the perception perspective. And overwhelming, yes, Golden State, just because of how they're playing and Cleveland is not doing the job. It's going to be interesting to me. I, to me, I just want to see that first round series with Cleveland just to see if we see a, a semblance of who they were early in the season. See, if they you, do that... You think we're even going to get that in the first round? I, I think, think, I think it, we're still going to see regular season but th type. Th that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I hope we do because there are little things to me defensively that I can pick out or you can pick out and say, you know, that's a little bit different than what they were doing late in the I, season. I want to get us back on point. We've circled back to the Cavaliers. Hmm. I want to circle back to Golden State. I thought you made an interesting point about 
no one taking them seven. And so th they kind of took the regular season off. And so there's 28 possible games for them to play in the postseason. I think for them to establish their greatness, they need to play as few of those 28 games as possible. Again, they should be hunting fo fo fo, and 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 can't get there. But I am going to judge this team on how quickly they dispatch these opponents. That's how they can establish their greatness. They didn't want to go for it in a regular season. I hope they're ready to go for it in the postseason. Mm -hmm. And the le the fewer number of games they play, the more credit I'll give them. That is a good point because they they really weren't going for 73. I think they could have chased it. I don't know if they could have gotten it, Why? but they. Because it was like we saw that strain in the win 73, oh, yeah. and then we didn't Mental. win the championship. Yeah. No, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Why would they even try to do that? Oh, it yeah, yeah. To them. But to, to Jason's point, those are the types of things that get you remembered as an all-time great team. If you do win 70, it doesn't have to be 73. You win 70 and run through the playoffs, then people are looking at you, you as an all-time great team. So I agree with you. If they, like, Play 20 maybe lose games. one game or Five two games, games yeah. in the whole... But, what, but wouldn't it be something else? Isn't if they win the championship? It's still a, a yeah, championship. It's a championship. Yeah. But there are, you know, we judge teams by how, you know, how dominant they were in the playoffs, too. So, you know, I mean, yeah, when I think of great playoff teams, I the first thing I think of is Moses Malone's faux 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 team. Yeah. That was a dominant, and, and I the think Kobe they lost Lakers one game. Team Kobe that only yeah. lost one to Ivory. Yeah. And, and yeah. So, so this Golden State team, think about it. I think it was 12 teams that have won 67 plus games you know, in the history of the game, and eight of them won a championship. So you're talking about putting yourself in a position, if you're Golden State, to be in the upper echelon. And a lot of those teams, we're talking about Boston, L.A., yeah. some of the Celtic teams back in the day. But this Golden State team has a chance to not only do it this year, but down the line because of their core. And I think how they're built organizationally. Guys are willing to play together. And you can see that on the court. And again, I picked the Cavs at the beginning because I thought that Kyrie was the difference. I'm still hoping that the Cavs come around, but this is a very special Golden State team. All right, welcome back. Christine and I are joined by Fox NFL analyst Greg Jennings and Steelers Pro Bowl linebacker and former Ohio State Buckeye Ryan Shazier. Ryan denies being involved in paying off the officials during <laughs> the Michigan game this year, but we'll check later after the show. All right, let's move to Pittsburgh, where Big Ben Roethlisberger confirmed this week that he will return to the Steelers for his 14th season after battling through injuries and dealing with some tough playoff losses the last few years. Big Ben shocked a lot of people by actually floating some retirement talk during the offseason. I happen to never really buy it, but I think I understand what Big Ben was trying to do. I think he's trying to put some pressure on the organization and let the organization have a sense of urgency going into this offseason and moving forward that, look, at any time, the Big Ben era could end. Have we maxed this out? Have we gotten the three, the four, the five championships that we should be trying to get with me at quarterback? I think it's been a good move by Big Ben. I'm not surprised that he's all in. I, th this, this is playing out, I think, perfectly for the Steelers organization. Exactly. I remember many times throughout the season when Ben Roethlisberger would say something, um, especially after a loss, and talk about the physicality of their practices and Mike Tomlin being tougher than any of the other coaches and the fact that they had so many more injuries than other teams. And it was almost surprising to me how open he was about basically taking shots at Mike Tomlin. So when he said that he was thinking about retirement, I didn't take it seriously for even a second. To me, it just went along with all of his other comments throughout the season. I see you shaking your head over there, but it did say you're, you're right. It was like it was posturing to get something done with the franchise. I honestly feel, uh, listening, when I heard it, the news, I, I believe him 100%. I know he, my teammate, and I won him dear, here dearly, and I'm happy that he's coming back. But uh, I understand all the stuff he's been through, how hard practices are, how banged up he gets through, gets playing in all the games he plays. He's uh, he's played, what, going into his 14th year now, so hey, after a while he gets banged up, probably want to spend some time with his kids, and I, I totally understand, but we, we definitely need Ben to get these, uh, this, this run we about to go on. Did you feel like it was extremely physical? 
compared to maybe what some of the other teams were going through in practice? A lot of teams tell me that they don't really hit, but hey, that's still the way we like, we like to hit, uh, especially the defense. So uh, we understand that that's, that molds us for the season. It kind EFC of, North football. Yeah, it molds it. Like, when we play the Baltimore Ravens and things like that, it, those are going to be tough games. When you're not hitting in practice and hitting throughout camp, it's going to come back and bite you in the butt. For me, being in that situation, I, number one, I definitely took it serious. And Ryan, you know, as a teammate, anytime your teammate starts talking about retirement, it's not just to yeah. talk. To your point, though, Jay, I, I get it. Yeah. it. There may have been some strategy behind it, but I definitely think he was seriously considering it. Um, I never personally believed that he would do it, but I definitely think he was considering once you think when you think about his career, the hits that he takes, the injuries that he's amassed over the course of his career, that builds up. He has a family. He has other things that he's thinking about now versus just football. And then a young team, not a team that is guaranteed locked to be at the top of the AFC every single year. We all know how hard that is, and the window of opportunity shuts on you fastly, fast. So with you talking about should we should be in the runnings for three, four, five, whatever championships, he's looking at all of that. Are we wasting time? We talk about Aaron Rodgers and are the Packers wasting time with Aaron Rodgers? The Steelers, it looks like that's what's taking place. They've had opportunities. They've missed out on opportunities, but every year presents another mindset and another approach. If, if Big Ben exits football having only won two Super Bowls with the Steelers, would you feel like the organization underachieved? Should he have produced more titles than that? That's not talking about Big Ben. That's talking about the organization. Have y'all maxed out Big Ben? Uh, I, I'm not going to just say it's the organization. It, it can fall back on some of us. Like, we didn't have a good year as a defense towards the end of the, the season. When we played the Patriots, we could have played a lot better as a defense. I understand we had some pieces missing, and we didn't play a good game. And, and that can count on to Ben's legacy. He played it. He, he did the best he could. But if we're not stopping anybody, he, all he, they're pinning up numbers. We, we can't do nothing about that. So I'm not going to say the organization is uh, – uh, they, they maxed out on them because they're doing everything they can, I, I honestly feel, to do the best to get you. I, I want to be authentic with you in the house. It would not be fair to bring you on the show. Colin and I have been a little bit critical of Mike Tomlin. And Terry Bradshaw came on this show and was critical of Mike Tomlin. You obviously play for Mike, respect Mike. Tell us why we're wrong when we say this organization under Mike Tomlin isn't as buttoned up, isn't as disciplined as it should be. Too many players getting out of control, Joey Porter getting out of control, sometimes Mike Tomlin out of control. Are we wrong when we say that's a bad reflection on Mike? Yeah, I definitely feel like you're wrong because everybody has a different style of leadership. Every parent has a different style of raising their kid. And I feel when it's time to go out there and play, everybody's buttoned up, everybody understands their responsibility, and everybody understands who's the boss. Uh, we, we, we have some guys on the team that might do some silly stuff, that might do some stupid stuff, and we got some guys that's going to tighten them up. But at the end of the day, when Coach Tomlin, when he comes talk to us, he has a relationship with every single person and knows how to coach each person. When, when Antonio does something, he coaches Antonio totally different than he coaches me. Like because, and you're good with that. And I'm cool with that because I understand that everybody's different. Like, I can't raise my son one way and you raise your son the same way and expect our son to be exactly the same. And every person's different. You can't all raise people the same way and expect everybody to act the same. And we all have a, a, a great relationship with him, but when it's time to button everything up, get in the playbook, and try to go out there and get everything you got, you're going to do it for a guy like that that you know that really care about you and that's going to go out there and, and uh, hang his hat out there for Hell you. Hell of an answer. Great how, job. How does, he, how does he coach <laughs> Ben Roethlisberger? Huh? How does he coach Ben Roethlisberger? Hey, him, and ben, him and Ben relationship is... is, is uh, is uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain because both of them are almost near age. So, uh, but him and Ben, they talk about situations that they need to talk about. Like he might yell at a, a younger player more than he might yell at Ben, or he might uh, him and Ben they talk to each other and Ben like, hey, I'm feeling banged up today. I might not, I might not can go. T Coach Tomlin, when Ben says something, he understands that Ben really means it. With a younger guy, be like, hey, Coach Tomlin, I'm banged up. I don't feel like I need to practice. You're like, hey, man, get out my face, go practice. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes you understand that younger guys, sometimes they're just not putting everything they have into the game like the way Ben has. 
And and I, I think that's when, when coaching comes in, you can't just treat everybody the same. We may have to circle back to that question, that topic, because that sounds different than Belichick and Brady. Mm -hmm. That sounds like more of a collaboration where Belichick's more of a Power dictator. Struggle. All right, to a strange story involving Eli Manning, a lawsuit filed three years ago by sports memorabilia collectors claims Eli, the Giants, and a team equipment manager knowingly provided false game-worn memorabilia to collectors. Manning turned over an email that was sent to the Giants head equipment manager back in 2010 asking, quote, for two helmets that can pass as game used. According to ESPN, the email was included with up to 200 pages of documents linking Manning to the lawsuit. This is a fascinating story. I I'm not going to come down real hard on Eli Manning because I happen to believe this is pervasive throughout sports. Uh, and, and I think if people, and I don't want to go way off into details on this, I'm friends with a guy named Mike Ornstein, very well known in NFL circles. Yes. I hope, and there, I'm sure people in the NFL are hoping there's another stand-up guy like Mike Ornstein that'll fall on his sword and stand on his head and do the time for everybody because Mike Ornstein's a stand-up guy and protected a lot of people in the NFL. This is pervasive college sports, NFL sports, Eli's got his hands caught in the cookie jar. I can't, it's hard for me to demonize him because I don't think he's in this by himself. The whole memorabilia world in general just seems really shady, shady. to me. I mean, the last time Ask the most recent, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was gonna say the most recent time I saw anything about memorabilia on TV, it was in OJ's Las Vegas hotel room. So that just tells you <laughs> kind of what we're looking at. And I also see, I I just don't believe that Eli had malicious intent here. It almost seemed like he's like, hey, can you go look at our collection of helmets and find two of them that might be game used, not pass as game used, maybe that was the wrong word to use, but maybe they don't differentiate which one we use. And you, you could probably tell us yeah, better. It, it, number one, it was, I, I'm with you. I, I, can't, I can't come down hard on Eli because we've all been in this similar situation. It's just not been publicized and it, it was an agreement. It was an agreement. Everyone in the circle of agreement knew that if it was authentic or not authentic, it was okay. So as a player, you, you really remove yourself. You're, the only reason why I look at Eli and I'm like, man, you kind of got knotted up in it is because of the emails link him to it. But as far as just signing a signature of, of what they present you, your hands are off of what it is. Players get helmets and jerseys that are not authentic, authentic all the time and have to, have to just write, I mean, put your name on there, your signature. But it's not, you don't really all the time know and even care for that matter. And in this sense, he knew and he didn't really care because the people, so it, exactly, yeah. those who were in agreement didn't mind it. So those who are purchasing it, they don't really know. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it all falls into one category of, man, is, is this Eli's signature? That's all they really care about. That's all they care about. Uh, I know there's been pl plenty of situations where I'll see something and I'll look at it and I was like, all right, yeah, yeah, all right, here you go. Exactly. Hey, I, hey, and the thing is, you, you really don't know like what you're signing sometimes. And then I'm still trying to get caught up on how did they find these emails and, and things like this, because that's crazy to me. But and like you said, the memorabilia, it gets kind of shady sometimes when you have to sign certain things and then and people trying to come back at you if it's real or not. I'm just doing my job signing it and trying to give it to you. He's also made over $200 million in his career. Do you really think he's going to get himself in that much trouble over a couple thousand dollars? Funny, though, you owe people favors, and it doesn't matter how much money you, yeah. you've made. You Absolutely. owe them a favor. Yeah, you're right, right, right. Ryan, I got to say this, man. Chris Carter has set the bar so low for Ohio State grad. <laughs> you jumped so far over it, I'm sitting here shocked that someone who loves and cares about Michigan, I didn't even know they educated kids at no. Ohio State. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Christine and I are joined by Chris Broussard and the founder of the big league, Jason McIntyre. Let's move to New York, where the Knicks disaster of a season is finally over, and Phil Jackson addressed the media for the first time all year and was asked if he wants Carmelo Anthony back next year. Do you, uh, do you want him back? We've not been able to win with him on the court at this time, and I think the direction with our team is that he is a player that 
will be better off somewhere else and using his talent somewhere where he can win or chase that championship. Right now, we need players that are really active, can play every single play, defensively and offensively. That's really important for us. We started to get some players on the floor that can do that. And, you know, that's the direction we have to go. That was Phil Jackson going full hit him up. Uh, no Vaseline by Ice Cube. <laughs> I mean, he just went all he in. Uh, he let us know how he feels about Carmelo Anthony. Uh, it's time for Carmelo to move on. Car Carmelo has offered a response over Instagram yeah. that's kind of mysterious. I don't know if we can interpret this. The great Gatsby, Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, I don't know what that means. I probably would have went Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> I think it means he's just sitting back, very sophisticated, keeping an eye on what's going on. He's basically telling Phil, I see you. Phil see just told doing. him you're on the Titanic and you're going down, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that, that's exactly true. You know, I'm just kind of sick of Phil Jackson not being a man. Like, say it to my face. Go have a conversation with Carmelo, man to man, and deal with this away from the media. How many times this season does he have to throw Carmelo under the bus? Whether or not he's the problem, it's just not a good look, especially for other free agents, guys that are going to come play for the Knicks. When you know that you have Phil Jackson, you got to watch your back, or he's going to call you out publicly. It just doesn't work. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is a guy, Melo, who's going to be a Hall of Famer. This is a guy. <laughs> Dude, everybody Hold gets on. into the NBA. He's not. Hall of Fame. He's in, he's oh, no, don't even diss him. He's a legitimate Hall of Famer. This yeah. is a guy that's a three time Olympian. Mock it if you will, but he becomes friends with other players around the league that the Knicks are going to want to court. I like And him. if they like Carmelo, they're looking at this like, man, this dude is crazy. Beyond that, it makes no sense for the trade value. Now you've let everybody know, look, we want to give dude away. So send us your cheapest yeah. offer and, and we'll take it. And I would like to Mello, see Melo come out tomorrow and say, look, I'm not waving the no trade yeah. calls, and I think Phil Jackson should be fired. There How you about go. That? You made now me think of talking. something. Wait, let's pull up that picture again, because I think I have a new interpretation. That might be that. I'm the boss. See, no, that he's the see boss. That, that thing he's holding, he's kind of like sticking it in the ground. It's Maybe that's him saying, I'm sticking here. Well, he says, stay me. Yeah, stay, stay mellow. mellow. Stay mellow. Oh, is that what that is? You got to get mellow with the lingo. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the NBA lingo. I guess. But, with my no but, trade. Guys, seriously, I mean, we're not surprised Phil Jackson's saying this. He has had no earthly idea how to run this franchise for the last four this years. This is your team. Yeah, unfortunately, it is. Hey, when are we going to start talking about Phil Jackson? You, we love to talk about the rings, the ones that Michael Jordan got him, the ones that Kobe and Shaq got him. He has no clue how to build a team. Chris, you can admit this. Four years now, he's been there, right? What, is, what has he done? Worse. What has he done? The, the, He's driven it further okay. into the ground. They're going if nowhere. If his name was Isaiah point. and he had a suntan, he'd have been run out of there. <laughs> but to your point, and all you guys, let me ask you this. Has he sullied his legacy? I, here's no way he can ruin coach. that legacy, but has he actually We're talking about it? In, in the NBA, where it's 3 and D and pace and space, he's talking about the triangle offense. That's, that's, that's like, problem. hey, let me start a, uh, what's this internet stuff? We don't need to mess with the internet. Let's just go back to typewriters. I, like, that's what he sounds like with this triangle offense Listen, garbage. I agree with you that he's in jeopardy of, he could have been the red R back of this era. I think that's off the table now. Yeah. Now he's just kind of a kooky coach <laughs> who had some success with Michael and Phil. And now I think, literally, Greg Popovich will be known as the greatest coach of this era over Phil. Greg Popovich won. Tim Duncan, great player, but not uh, yeah, he, Michael Jordan. Not, never had a co combination of Shaq yeah. and Kobe. Good point. Uh, so, yeah, I do think he's damaged himself. And I think when this is all... Greg Popovich is the guy that will be remembered fondly and revered. Phil will be the old guy that was a little bit crazy, loved to smoke weed, <laughs> kicked it with Jenny Buss, and got in arguments with all the players around the league. There is nothing zen about what he's doing here, either. Oh, it no. doesn't fit. That zen stuff yeah. is, you know what, was a bunch of hog. You know what, I'm saying? Sure, I think Phil was used to smoking a brand of weed in the 60s, mm -hmm. and he ain't used to this modern stuff they got today. <laughs> This is the Speak for Yourself podcast featuring the best of Colin Cowherd and Jason Whitlock. I'm your host, Jason McIntyre. Listen, everybody have a great, safe Easter weekend. If you're stuck in the car, you know you can find us on your phone. We're on SoundCloud, YouTube. You subscribe to us on iTunes. Respond on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We're out there. 
All right, guys, hey, quick reminder, we had an awesome Facebook Live this morning. Me, Joy Taylor from Undisputed, Chris Broussard. Really check it out. A lot of fun to get you excited. You know what? I'm going to say it. It'll get you crunk for the NBA playoffs. Listen, leave a comment. You'll love my shirt. I know it. Take it easy. Have a great weekend. See you Monday.